So maybe you've tried to keep homeschool checklists in the past and they just haven't seemed to work for you. I'm going to suggest something that might be counterintuitive. To make homeschool checklists work for you, you might need a few more of them. In fact, I'm going to suggest you need three homeschool checklists for the checklist to help your homeschool day flow well. Hi, I'm Misty Winkler, homeschool mom of five with two graduates now, only homeschooling three, and author of the book, The Convivial Homeschool, Gospel Encouragement for Keeping Your Sanity While Living and Learning Alongside Your Kids. I've tried many different checklist iterations over the years. We've tried all kinds of formats. I've kept my plans in all kinds of apps and papers and planners and all the things. But the format doesn't matter as much as having the information written out and having it in places where it is easy to refer back to and use. To make your homeschool checklists usable, you need to keep three different checklists. And because they work together so well, it's actually easier to keep three distinct checklists than one. That's what I found. And that's what I'm going to explain today in this episode. So grab a basket of laundry to fold and let's dig in. All right, so the first homeschool checklist that you need is actually your annual plan, your lesson plans for the entire school year. All the other checklists are based off of the plan for the year. And so when the plan for the year isn't put together, then we find that we procrastinate making the weekly checklists because so many decisions have to be made before we can make those checklists. When we make those decisions ahead of time, prepare them in easy to reference lists, then making the weekly checklists is a breeze. So that work that we put in in the summer to make up those lesson plans for the whole year really does pay off. But lesson plans sounds really complicated. It sounds really fancy. And all my annual lesson plans amount to is a bunch of checklists for each subject that each kid is doing mapped out for the year. So taking each book that they're supposed to read, doing the division necessary to figure out how many pages they need to read each day or each week, and then a plot for that. And then I do just make it as a checklist rather than like a calendared plan because I make fewer checklist lines than there are school days or school weeks so that there is some buffer for illness or whatever. And then we just do the next thing on the checklist. So when I go to make the weekly school templates, I just look at the next thing on each subject, one at a time, plugging it in. Keeping my annual plans in this kind of checklist format helps me to not feel behind. It helps me to not put in unnecessary time during the school year rearranging everything. There really is no need to rearrange anything when all I have are a bunch of checklists. And I've kept these checklists in Evernote. I've made them in spreadsheets on Google Sheets or Numbers. I have made them in Notion. I've tried all kinds of things and where the list is doesn't matter so much as the fact that there is a list. I know where it is and I actually look at it each week to see if we're on track. If you need more help making that kind of annual checklist plan, then you want to check out Pam Barnhill's Plan Your Year. 
I'll put a link in the description to that. We did homeschool planning pretty much the same way before she wrote that book and her book lays it out super clearly. So I don't plot out subjects like math where it's obvious that you're going to just do the next lesson, especially because we use math you see where you are supposed to do it for mastery. So when we get to the kids checklists, I will say math is on every kid's checklist for every day, but my master list for the whole year doesn't have how far they're going to get. I don't know that ahead of time. But when it comes to a history book or our theology book or a science book, the goal is to finish the book. With math, we might do less than a book or more than a book in a year. And so I don't schedule that out even as a checklist. We just have a certain amount of time that we do math every day. But for history books, anything where we're using a whole book that we or a lecture series um, like Old Western Culture or Dave Raymond History we've done before, I take how many lessons there are, how many videos, how many chapters, how many pages, and then I look at how often we're going to do that, count, count them up, you know, it's all basic math, do some division, and make a list. And then every week as I assign it, I just check it off. It makes it super simple and fast to make that annual plan. It's not complicated. And that time really pays off because it makes knowing where we're at very clear. And when I go make the kids checklists every week, I know where we're at. It's very fast to put them together. I don't really have to make any decisions. I just have to check what's next. All right, so the second kind of homeschool checklist is the kids checklist. Now we're counting this as one checklist, but actually you need one per kid, right? So I don't know how many checklists that is for you, but every student in our house has their own weekly checklist. Now, a lot of times I will change up the format every year just to do something a little bit fresh, but also it is often the case now that I have older students or a range of students that different kids will have different formats of checklists. And we're going to talk about this in the next video more in depth. So be sure to come back for that video. But the kind of checklist that works best for an eight year old is not the same kind of checklist that you want to be giving a 16 year old. With the eight year old, you're actually just teaching them how to use a checklist. And so it should have very large font, be very clear what's happening each day and everything that they do should be on that list, even if they do it with you. But we're going to talk about that more in the next video. It's a very basic kind of checklist. By the time we have students who are 16, we want to be able to hand them a list of their work they need to do for the week. Not already plotted out on days, just a list of all the work that has to happen that week. And they are responsible for getting their work done that week. Of course, some subjects like math, like piano practice have to be done daily. And so there might be a like habit tracker type checklist that they have. But as far as the assignments, they have to keep track of homework that was given for each class. They have to make sure things are done on time and they likely will have to be managing their homeschool assignments alongside a job. You want your high schoolers to be figuring out some time management things. And so the format of their list and the way that you give it to them will matter. But again, more on that in the next video. The important thing is that each student has their own checklist that's at their level, keeping them on track, even when you aren't necessarily paying direct attention to them. They have a list to go to to refer to, to look at and know what they should be doing next. It's not all on you as the mom to keep track of everything. Now, even though it might not be on us as moms 
every moment of the day all the time. And we do need to be teaching our kids how to work from a list and how to have a good work ethic and how to be accountable to doing what they should be doing. That is still our job as mom, especially homeschool mom. So, so we do have a lot to keep track of as moms. And that's why we need our own separate checklist from the kids checklist. When we give our kids a homeschool checklist, it is not total delegation where now we are not tracking and we are not checking. We are just saying, okay, do that. Check in with me. It's your responsibility to check in with me. Mm -mm. Checklists will be lost. Checklists will be forgotten. And we need to have our own checklist accountability to help keep ourselves and everyone else on track. So our checklist as mom should have group lessons, check-ins with different kids that need to happen, the list of the high schoolers work that might happen any day, but we do need to keep track. Like, is it actually happening though? homework that we should be seeing turned in and then whether or not we actually check it and the work that each of the younger students should be doing each day. As homeschool moms, we need to not keep all those details in our head, but we need to have a reference that we can look at at a glance and see is the work being done? Are we on track? What should we be doing next? Instead of that being a thinking question that we have to come to a decision on, that's a question that just prompts us to look at the checklist that has it all laid out. Even if we don't keep it up every single day, the checklist still provides a great weekly check-in point to say, oh, wait a second, have I seen this kid's work? And call them and you have a prompt, a reminder on your checklist to check in on their checklist and discover whether or not they've lost it. So the three checklists that we need to stay on top of everyone's work and keep everyone working productively in the homeschool so that we don't get far behind and we do encourage work ethic and require a good work ethic are a master annual checklist plan for each student for all the subjects, a weekly checklist for each student, and a weekly master checklist for mom. Sometimes my mom's master checklist was just printing another copy of the kids checklist and keeping them together on a clipboard for me. Sometimes I've kept it digitally, sometimes on paper. The way that we keep track isn't as important as keeping track, having a written place to go look at, to know what to do next, and checking in on that regularly. Now, checking in on that regularly and teaching our kids to use checklists is a huge part of the process. So that's why I'm going to talk about that next time. So even though the format of your checklists doesn't matter that much, it is still helpful sometimes to just have a head start by using someone else's format. That's why I've set up the homeschool checklist templates based on those that I've used over the years. You can find those as a free resource available at Simply Convivial. Just check out the link in the show notes or go to simplyconvivial.com slash checklist. That's simplyconvivial.com slash checklist to get the homeschool checklists that you can edit and make your own. After you have your checklists, you have to actually use them with your kids to keep them accountable. So that's why in the next episode, we're gonna talk about using checklists to teach kids how to do independent work independently and what that really means. You don't want to miss it. So be sure to check out that next video right here.